This is a bat. Bats range from adorable to having faces that look like the after picture of an OSHA warning poster. But the reason we're talking about bats is because many of them have a superpower. One they share with creatures like dolphins and whales. A power which we want for ourselves. And that's the ability to scream and find out where their food is from the reflection. Better known as echolocation. Since it's still technically illegal to forcibly turn people into monstrous bat creatures, for our echolocation powers we instead turned to the dark arts of physics and built this, the Manbat 9000. But before I can explain how it works and how we're going to test it, we first need to understand how echolocation works in the first place. Most of the animals that can echolocate aren't actually just shouting, which is how echolocation is usually portrayed. Instead, they've each evolved special mechanisms to focus the sounds they make into a relatively tight beam. For example, dolphins shoot out at least one, if not two, fairly narrow beams of ultrasound for their echolocation, which they can direct quite precisely. They've evolved a special structure in their head specifically to amplify and transmit those sounds and point where the beam goes. So while they can and will make wider calls to search a big area, or just listen passively, a lot of the time if they're actively searching, they're using a focused beam. And those beams are no joke, there's a reason you can hear whales from so far away underwater. The calls from sperm whales reach intensities as high as 230 decibels, which is comfortably enough to burst your lungs or shatter your bones if you were right in front of the whale in the water, a fact they will use to hunt and kill, or at the very least, stun prey before eating them. Divers that have swam with sperm whales have described their body as aching afterwards just from the sound emissions of the creatures. Bats too use tricks to focus their sound into beams, but they had to solve the problem differently since they need to remain light so they can fly. So instead of a giant blob of fat, their faces have evolved structures to focus their sounds, which is also why many of them look like they stuck their face into a vacuum cleaner. All those weird flappy bits are actually the pinnacle of sonic technology. By changing the frequency of their calls and making chirps high into the ultrasound range, they can narrow or widen the beam formed by their clicks from 50 degrees to 20 degrees, which is really quite narrow when you think about a sound propagating in air. So really, echolocation is often a lot more like searching around with a flashlight made out of sound than it is the sort of wide-ranging call and response you might have been picturing. Now, the big question. Is the hard part of echolocation generating the sound or processing the return. By that I mean, if we could somehow give humans the ability to shoot a beam of sound out of their face like dolphins, can our brains process and use it to navigate and find things? Or do you need to evolve both the special scream and a special brain to make use of the superpower? Bats and dolphins are not only able to locate prey, but also tell a fair bit about their environment from how their calls change when they interact with different materials, and then use all of that information to navigate around in pitch darkness. That, of course, brings us back to the Manbat 9000, which, as you might now expect, is a helmet that allows you to shoot a highly focused beam of sound out of your head. This little contraption on the front is called a parametric speaker, which, unlike pretty much any speaker you've interacted with, has some incredibly weird properties. The primary one, of course, being that the sound comes out in a very tight beam that feels sort of like a sound laser. Normally, if you're near a speaker and tip it so it's a little bit off axis, you still hear it, it's just a little bit quieter. But with a parametric speaker, if it isn't pointed directly at you, you basically don't hear it. And weirder still, if you're not being directly hit with the beam, the sound seems to be coming from wherever the beam of sound is hitting. So if I aim the speaker at the wall, the sound seems to be coming from the wall. So what's going on here? Obviously, there's some physics trickery at play. When you look at the business end of this, you'll probably notice that it's actually an array of many tiny emitters. But those aren't speakers. They're ultrasound transducers, meaning they can only make ultrasound. Because, and this is going to sound weird, this speaker does not shoot out audible sound. At least, not directly. There are actually three effects being used simultaneously to make this weirdness work. The first is that the higher the frequency of a sound, the more directional its propagation will be. This is the trick that bats use, and why this uses ultrasound transducers. Regular frequencies that humans can hear just spread out too much. 
This is the same reason why ultrasound probes for medical imaging use ultrasound that's even higher in frequency, in the many hundreds or millions of hertz range. They want those waves going in as close to a straight line as possible. Moving on, the next effect is that if you have many small emitters instead of one big one, you've made something called a phased array, which can further tighten the beam that's formed. Here's a little simulation to help explain how this works. When we have one transmitter, the waves simply propagate outwards, spreading widely. But what happens when we add a few more and make them release waves at the same time? Now the waves that each emitter makes will interact, and some areas will get stronger and some areas will cancel out. As we add more and more emitters, the beam gets narrower and narrower as the signals interact, amplify, and cancel out in different areas. Something really cool that we can do with this is point the beam without any moving parts. Watch what happens when we start introducing a slight delay to the emitters. If we make a nice gradient of delay from left to right, where the first emitter is the most delayed and the last emitter is the least delayed, we can see that the beam has shifted from center to one side. And if we introduce the same delay but starting from the other side, we can push the beam the other way. One neat thing is that this also works in reverse, so if you were to do this with radio and set up an antenna array the same way, where there's a phase delay between each antenna, you can virtually point where the array can receive signals from, again with no moving parts. And that's how the Starlink antennas work. They use a phased array to keep communication with the moving satellites without needing to swing a big dish around. Now, look what happens when I add an object to the simulation. We've made the beam release pulses, so this is easier to see, but all we're doing is turning the beam on and off and presetting the beam angle. Here's a comparison of how the same rhythmic pulses bounce off some different objects. For example, here's a simple circle versus a complex shape like a moth. Immediately, you can see that the waves are reflected back to the emitters, but the returning waves look very different. Remember how we mentioned that the critters that can echolocate are able to tell a lot about what their beams are hitting just from the return? This is why. Every object that the beam will hit will have a unique fingerprint in the way the sound returns. Relevant to our example, when the beam hits a flat object, like a wall straight on, we should expect a basically perfect return. Little distortion to the signal and it should be loud and clear. However, we should be wary of hitting flat surfaces at an angle because it can throw the sound into weird directions and make it seem like it's coming from somewhere it isn't. This is also why stealth aircraft always look so angular. It's so that when radar waves hit them, they get shot off at weird angles that the antennas can't then pick up. And having played around with the speaker while we were building this, I can say with confidence that all of these effects are very real. For the sake of our project, all the emitters are in phase, which means they're all transmitting exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, so the beam is primarily focused forward. This way, we have to manually use our head to direct the beam, which should help tie in the environmental response into our brains better. Now, this is all well and good, but we sort of still have a problem. We have a focus beam of ultrasound, but humans can't hear ultrasound. That's literally how ultrasound is defined. So how do we make it so that we know when the beam hits something and makes it sort of more usable for humans? Well, that is the magic of frequency mixing. Here is a really crude example. I'm in an audio program called Audacity, and it lets me generate simple, single-frequency tones. For example, here is 440 hertz, which is an A note. Now, I apologize in advance to our younger viewers, this next bit is going to be annoying. I've set up three sounds for this demo. These two are 19 kilohertz and 18 kilohertz respectively. These are quite high pitched and older viewers may not even be able to hear the tones at all. Here's 19 kilohertz. And here's 18 kilohertz. And finally, here's them together. Now, watch what happens when I turn on the third track, which is 1 hertz. Suddenly, there is a whole range of noises being made that all of you should be able to hear now. When you combine pure tones, they'll mix to form harmonics at frequencies that you didn't start with. So a few high frequency sounds combined can make low frequency noises if you mix them correctly. This is the trick of the parametric speakers. The electronics process the sounds coming from an audio source like a phone, and then deconstructs it into a series of ultrasound tones that when added together will sum and mix back into the original sound. 
But for the waves to mix, they need to hit something, which is why the sound seems to be coming from the wall, or the object the beam is hitting. Or, in the case of it being aimed directly at you, it sounds like the sound is coming from inside your head, which is a super weird experience. Even looking directly at the speaker, it is not obvious that that's where the sound is coming from, because again, it sounds inside you. Now, I should say, we didn't invent or even design this speaker. We got it as a kit from a Japanese supplier on eBay. It just came as a bag of parts and some very broken English instructions, but, I mean, it also worked immediately with very little messing with it. All we did was 3D print a housing and then hollow out a bike helmet to mount all the electronics and a battery pack to power it. One bonus of this being synthetic echolocation is that there is no restriction on what sound you use for your search beam. But for the sake of not getting copyright strikes and to embrace our inner bat, I've created a repeating track of actual recordings of bats echolocating. So, how are we going to test our new echolocation powers? Well, if we are to become the bats, we're going to need some prey. So we picked up these delightful moth costumes and borrowed a local dance studio to have a big open space to test in. The speaker doesn't have the best range, so this will help keep it fair. And since there are nice flat walls, we can try and use those as a reference for navigation, though we'll see how well that works out. The way this is going to work is the person wearing the helmet will be blindfolded, then spun around a few times so they won't know where the moths are. The moths will quietly find a place in the room, and then the bat, using only their new echolocation powers, will have to locate them. If they successfully tag a moth, we count that as a success. I decided to go first, so the boys helped me get the helmet on and blindfold and get me all sorted. Okay, so I think I'm aimed at a wall. This, this feels like wall. Wall. Good. Okay. So that is the wall return. So if I turn 90 degrees, that should be the wall I'm hitting there. Wall. Okay. So I got a wall and a wall. I found a person. I found a moth. <laughs> Yay! I found a moth. Okay, one one moth down. <laughs> I can find the other one. Hello. <laughs> well, I got somebody. That was cool. <laughs> I assume I assume that's Ben. No. Okay, this is a wall in front of me. The return's too good. Oh. You found the same moth. Oh, I found the same moth. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> okay, there's a wall there. I think. Wait, there's something. What the fuck is this? Did I get him? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> I moved out of the way earlier. I thought you'd follow that. Well, I, I thought it was Ben. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, cool. That's a success. Yes. Fuck yeah. <laughs> All right, who wants to go next? All right. Honestly, I was astounded at how well this worked. Not only was navigating super easy, it didn't take long to figure out what the difference between the beam hitting the wall or a target sounds like. 
The analogy of a flashlight made of sound that I gave earlier honestly could not be more apt, as that really was what it felt like to use. But was it a fluke? Both Frank and Jonah also took turns and had very similar experiences, first identifying what it feels like for the sound to hit a wall and getting their bearings, then getting used to the difference between a wall and a target, then pretty quickly beelining for a moth. So no, not a fluke at all. It was incredibly repeatable, which means that we have our answer. The human brain absolutely can echolocate if only you give it the sound laser power, which means that evolutionarily, all you need to evolve is making the noise. Neural circuits are already plenty capable of dealing with the data just fine without special modifications. Also, it was super weird being on the receiving end and being the target. Not only were there beams of sound jumping around the room, it was very obvious when you're being targeted. I can totally understand the panic of an insect or a fish must feel when being hunted by critters that can do this. I think that moving forward, what would be really interesting would be to get somebody who is blind and see how they're able to make use of the helmet. I feel like as a day-to-day -day tool, something like this could be actually really useful while not being very expensive. Let us know in the comments if that's something you'd like to see us test in the future. Now, before you go, I have something important to talk about. Merchandising. Merchandising? What's that? Merchandising. Come, I'll show you. Open up this door. That's right, you heard the whales. We have a brand new store. We've spent the last few months completely rebuilding it from the ground up, so that not only is every product now higher quality than ever, because we switched to local manufacturers, we managed to bring down the price of almost everything by at least $10. You've been seeing some of the incredible designs we now carry throughout the video, but there is so much more to see. To celebrate the launch of the store, we added this brand new design, which honestly, I think might be the best one yet. And for those of you that missed your chance to get one of our handmade papyrus mummy assembly instruction posters, they're now permanently back in stock. While the merch and our amazing designs are wonderful, this is only the beginning for us. Part of rebuilding the store was setting up the infrastructure to be able to carry not only merch, but other things as well, like science materials or maybe DNA at some point in the future. And we have so many more incredible additions planned for the rest of the year. So head on over to thethoughtemporium.ca and pick up something today. It's one of the best ways to support the channel and help us fund projects like this and things like our ongoing Neuron project, which will have a new episode out in a month or two. And to celebrate the launch, the first 50 people to use the code MANBAT will get 10% off their order. And finally, we need to talk about the sauce. Open Sauce, that is. Open Sauce is the amazing YouTube slash maker convention that was started last year by William Osman and Co., and I can comfortably say it's the best event of the year. I'll be going again this year and will be joined by literally so many of your favorite creators that I could easily add a few minutes of runtime to this video just naming all of them. There'll be panels, small group question and answer sessions, and talks given by amazing creators and makers. And not only that, but there's going to be a massive convention floor with 500 booths this year. Booths with what, you ask? Well, last year there were robots, spaceships, and more amazing projects on display than I could count. But this year, there'll be all of that, but importantly, potentially, your projects. Applications are open until at least May 1st, so if you have a cool project that you want to show off to 15,000 of your closest new friends, check out the link in the description. I literally cannot recommend open sauce enough. It was so much fun last year, so I hope to see many of you there. And with that, we arrive at the end of this video. Links to everything can be found below, and as always, we'll see you next time.